Welcome back to Stories from the Field, the superintendent podcast where we look at education and educational leadership through the lens of equity. Last episode, we met Dr. Alex Marrero from Denver Public Schools. We kind of learned about his background and how that helped kind of toughen him up for his current role that he's in. The Board of Ed brought him in there to make some big decisions and make some big decisions is exactly what he did. But there was one terrible, tragic issue that tested his leadership pretty early in his tenure. Um, one of the tougher days, Doug. Um, if I can, I want to just tell you how that day play, played out. We had, and this is, I'm going to mention East High School where the incident happened. And we had a situation happen at East uh, several weeks prior, right. right? Two separate, right? Earlier in the year, around uh, October, November, in which I made an announcement at a board meeting saying, hey, we have a lot of competing priorities, uh, but please understand, Board of Education community, that my number one priority and the, the one that, that has me a little bit concerned is the access to guns and the violence in and around our schools. I was on the record early fall. Mm -hmm because of something that happened. It was a shooting that happened off grounds, but close to one of our schools. And one of our scholars was shot in, in the cheek and came out of his ear. And I remember going to Denver Health, which is our public hospital. And the young man writing, because who couldn't speak, why was I shot? And I had no answer for him. Imagine that. I'm supposed to give answers on why things happen here. And I didn't have an answer. So I just shrugged my shoulders and said, I'm gonna to try to do what I can. Mm -hmm. I never wanted to be in that situation again, not having answers for someone who was an innocent bystander. And then we had a, a situation in which one of our students was shot again off grounds, but again, student who attended the same school, who was, was shot in the head and at that time was critical. Mm -hmm. So although I didn't get to see the student, I got to see his family Oh. And and it was a big, big, big gathering there. And again, no answers. Important for me to note that throughout my tenure here, which has been now two years, we've had situations like this happen frequently. Um, all of them have been off school grounds, usually even in a neighboring county, but they have resulted in major injuries or loss of life. I was taken back by how I guess rudimentary this was here. Mm. I would get the notices, I would jump up from bed, and I would go, my goodness gracious, we lost a child. And then the team investigates, well, he, he was a child, but he was in a transition program, and now he was out of DPS. So there was no, no, no fanfare, if you will, mm -hmm. no communication, no follow-up. But to me, I'm sitting back saying, wait, where I'm from, First of all, this doesn't happen. I'm from New York City. Mm -hmm. The belly of the beast, some would say, right? The crucible where it all happens. Yeah. This is normalized here and 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 it's uncomfortable. So I wanna just note that this has been happening across our district, really our city for the past two years. Back to East High School, we've had these two situations which happened in close proximity to the school. And yeah. then the last one that happened inside of the school. I was sitting in, in anticipation of doing something, I should say, right? Um, I wanted to create the city initiative. Mm -hmm. I invited the mayor, the sheriff, um, our, our chief of police, and ultimately even our, our mayoral um, candidates because our mayor is term limited. He's leaving yeah, right. and we have two competing. Got it. Organize and, and uh, faith-based organizations like the who's who of mm -hmm. making something yeah. happen across the city. Yeah. Back to your question, that would normally not be in the job description for any educator or superintendent. Sure. But I felt like I had to. You you called them in. Yes. Yes. We're sitting here. First first meeting was here, preliminary. So we use this nice on the Zoom. Yeah. Then we started to really crank it up. Let's get in, into practice. And it was here. And if I can show you, can I? Yeah. I'm sitting here. I'm sitting here 
So I'm right here and I have Chief Thomas, Sheriff Diggings, um, a representative from the mayor's office, governor's office, and everybody who's a decision maker is on this Zoom. Someone barges into my office from our communications team, says, Dr. Murrow, we have a shooting at East again. So I say, pardon, we have a situation at East again. It's a shooting. I'll see you all there. And I pointed because you can see East from, from my office. Beautiful building, incredible tower. Mm -hmm. So we all head out to go to East. They beat me there, right? They have sirens on their car. They have escorts. And on my journey from here to there, it's a nine minute drive. Mm. I learned that this situation was different than all the others because it happened inside of the school. That little nuance changes everything mm -hmm. for an educator. Yeah. Changes everything in terms of the response. It changes everything in terms of the media coverage. I just mentioned that we have had loss of life for the past few years at alarming rates. Right. But it happened in a stolen car in Aurora over the weekend. And apparently the media doesn't care about that. Mm -hmm. But when it happens inside of our building, because it's attributed to perhaps a board decision when there wasn't an SRO, now it's politicized and now it's scandalous, it's front page news. We couldn't get a mom and pop coverage for everything that was happening in Bruce Randolph and DMLK, but now we have CNN, Wall Street Journal, in this office. Yeah. So I, I approach knowing that this incident happened inside of the school. So I see the mayor, I see the chief of police, and I said, gentlemen, I need you both to uh, tell me if you can give me an armed officer at East for the rest of the school year, because East now had three major incidences. They said, yes, not only will we give you one, we'll give you two, and I said, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. When I walked into the school, I saw our board uh, president and our board treasurer, um, of course, everybody was reacting to the situation. I explained to them what I just agreed to. They understood about East. Then I realized that we have oh, tens, tens of schools. We have 30 something schools that may say, wait, what about us? I just mentioned that we've had situations. So I had to make a tough decision. I had to make a tough decision. Not, I'm not gonna welcome this for any aspiring superintendent because you have seven bosses. In certain cases, there are five. In certain cases, there are nine. There are even some districts that have 15 or more. Yeah. You have to be a professional, um, but you also have to be responsive to the communities you serve. And overwhelmingly, in the two years that I've been here, uh, my leaders have been very, very much advocates to support in terms of our comprehensive schools in particular when it comes to armed officers and SROs. I had that already. So I, I knew that that's how they felt. In this situation, I needed some sort of presence at the school, which is being targeted, right, in terms of violence, clearly. Thankfully, the board did not question that. That was very, um, uh, in terms of immediate support. Mm -hmm. But I had to do it for the entire district, at least until the end of the school year, before yeah. things get out of control. So. What I did was I, I dictated uh, on my route from the school for my third visit to Denver Health now in a matter of months to go again and, and not have an answer. I was not going to do that because there's policy that's inhibiting me to do what I believe is necessary for the district. Board policy. Yes, board policy. So I was able to go. As you can imagine, I got beat up right, in terms of uh, the the, the families of the wounded, rightfully so. I'm the face of the district. Yeah, They feel like I'm responsible. Doesn't matter that I wasn't here for decisions that happened in 2018, 2020. Yeah. I'm the face of the district, you have to own that. So I, I took my bumps. I came back in here, a select a group of folks uh, after I, I, I shifted the language to make sure that it was exactly what I wanted to convey. And the message was very simple. I understand that this is based on values. I respect you all. I'm looking forward to, of course, continuing to serve. However, I'm the leader and I'm being responsive here. 
I welcome your support and let's discuss this later. But right now I have to take action. Mm -hmm. In essence, that was the message. Right. Um, I had some wordsmithers in here, you know, people yeah. who are paid to just make sure how this word aligns with the next word. But you're basically telling your bosses, I'm going to violate your policy. Oh, on paper, without a doubt. Yes. I, it's, I, it even says it in one of the lines. It says, I understand that this may be perceived as me violating policy. As leaders, we're given the latitude, right, to yeah. do in, in case of a crisis. Right. I, I would argue, if I was a lawyer, that that's what I was doing. Never something that I encourage anyone to do. Never thought in a million years that yeah. I but I wasn't thinking of the consequences, Doc. Right. I was prepared for whatever it was. Yeah, kids. So back to Richard. Richard has a saying that I guess I embodied in, in, in that act. Yeah. yeah, Richard Carranza is, do not be afraid to do your job because you're going to lose your job. I was doing the job. I knew for a fact that it was something that needed to happen. And I, mm. and, and, and I did it and whatever the consequences i believe i even put that in the memo i said mm -hmm. whatever consequences I'm, I'm willing to accept now what i didn't expect was for that letter to get out a public comment meeting tonight with the dps school board evolved into a shouting match at times denver 7's rob harris looks into where the discussion goes from here i'm not looking for accolades this topic Don't cut is her too mic. important do not cut her mic for us. Do not cut her mic. A public comment meeting with the DPS board Monday showed just how contentious the decision over school resource officers still is. If it took 10 years of research to, to remove SROs from schools, why does it only take three months to discount that work? Superintendent Dr. Alex Marrero brought in Denver Police Chief Ron Thomas to address the board and talk about what a partnership with the department could look like. But board members Ayante Anderson and Michelle Quattlebaum both spoke out about their concerns. The presence of officers would negatively impact students of color. They even had their mics cut off at points for speaking without being recognized. You're being very disrespectful. No, no, no. you cannot cut people's mics off and silence voices you don't want to hear. For some reason, this group cannot seem to function together. These are the kinds of arguments that are fueling the resigned DPS board movement. Before the board meeting started, members of the parent organization held a press conference doubling down on their call for every current member of the board to step down. This is a management job. This isn't being just a voice where you can go be a rabble rouser and you can say what you want. This is a management job and that's really important and I think too few of the members have that experience and I think that then you, you, you couple with that political ambition um, and it's just led to this incredibly dysfunctional and toxic atmosphere where they can't even talk to each other. They have set a very, very poor example, um, and this superintendent um, is also setting a bad example, and this culture of this board is, is downright toxic. It was supposed to be a discussion about team building for Denver's school board. Instead, it devolved into an insult trading name-calling blow-up. I want to know that you know what you did was wrong, and that you apologize for it, and you're not going to do it again. I'm not apologizing for exposing your misogyny and your sexism. The tension comes after months of animosity that came to a head in June when board chair Sochi Guyton did an interview with Westward in which she accused Vice Chair Tay Anderson and board member Scott Esserman of a secret coup attempt after she accused them of misconduct. The district hired mediators to help facilitate a ceasefire. It didn't work. I, I'm done. I'm so done. The bickering comes as test scores are about to be released. One of the board's mediators also warned members their clashes are costing kids. The community describes you as dysfunctional. Students describe you as dysfunctional. This is harmful. It's damaging. And the resulting outcomes aren't going to get any better. Many of you not even fully paying attention to the speakers tonight, choosing to be on your phones. This is the first time the board has held public comment since a student at East High shot two deans who patted him down for weapons. Listen to your employees that work directly with students and DPS parents. Families are learning more about these safety plans, plans DPS staff know well. Here's something that didn't make the news. January of this year, DPS placed a student who has previously been in four different facilities both mental health and Denver Youth Corrections at my school. This upcoming year, we do not walk into campus with implemented guns in our schools when it's guns that is the issue. DPS took a drastic measure that rolled back the historic racial justice policy. 
Those were victories for us. Some parents showed up with T-shirts calling on the board to resign, a move Vice President Ayante Anderson criticized on Twitter, quote, at least make it look like you represent the majority of DPS students. Hint, DPS is 80% BIPOC. This district, I believe, is a mess. A very dysfunctional board. Um, there is a lot of infighting. As you see in this face of this triangle, it is called lack of Absence. Superintendent Dr. Alex Marrero outlined how he plans to put together that comprehensive safety plan, something that families have been asking for. He's pulling together a variety of groups to get their perspective on what that should look like. The first draft of that plan will be released. on. This the is a tough one. I mean, it's this could happen anywhere. And unfortunately, it is happening other places. But the way he handled it, I think that could be helpful for for other superintendents to understand and see how he dealt with it. Yeah, and, and we did talk to other folks in the district, but we really wanted to spend some time understanding Dr. Marrero's perspective on it, his feelings, um, and just sort of what runs through your head when you have to experience a moment like that as, as an educator at any level. It's, it's the most horrific thing educators ever go through, a student injured on your watch. And then aside from that again, we have to think about the politics. We'll, we'll certainly explore that, and we, we have so far. You know, it gets into issues of how we should police our schools, and there's a theme that comes up that and has been in Denver well before Dr. Moreira got there, to say that, that police officers on campus were part of a school-to-prison pipeline mechanism, and that caused them to remove police officers from the schools. So this is a community that's wrestling with this issue and has been for years and probably will be long after Dr. Moreira leaves. In 2020, uh, before I arrived, the Board of Education, as a result of the George Floyd uh, murder, yeah. they were responsive and also the data, clear data that shows that um, many SROs and police actually um, have, have really, really increased the school to prison pipeline in terms of um, their their handcuff, handcuffing, ticketing, and imprisonment, yeah. and and I'm not one to dispute that. I, I acknowledge that. I know that it exists. Um, and the argument against SROs is that they can't prevent a mass shooting, and that's also valid, and it's been validated in terms of uh, the mass shootings that we've seen throughout some of these districts, uh, Uvalde being the, one of the most recent. Yeah. Um, and I believe Parkland as well over in, in Broward County. Right both had SROs. Yes. So I'm not here to dispute uh, the research and, and justified in terms of the board resolution, which was a resolution to right. remove uh, the SROs. But I also feel that we have to be continually responsive to the community. Mm -hmm. The needs, wants, and desires of the community not only are important, should drive the makeup of the Board of Education. So in a large organization like mine, it's impossible to tap 90,000 students on the shoulder and say, tell me what you want. And if you multiply that by two, some would say 1.5, because not everybody has two at home in terms of parents, right? So let's say it was 1.5. We have hundreds of thousands of folks, parents, students, and add in, let's say 20,000, if we include the contractors of employees. Hundreds mm -hmm. of thousands of constituents that we serve. Impossible to say, hey, tell me what you want. Easy to do when you have a district of 500, 1,000, 2,000, yep. yeah. yeah. arguably even 10,000 like I had to make sure that you have a system to make sure you can tap. Yeah. The Board of Education serves that purpose because they're duly elected by region and at large, right? Yeah. So a, a school superintendent can say, hey, in the case of a crisis, is your group, constituents, those that put you in office will be supportive of said initiative. That's a default, right? We haven't used that here, mm -hmm. but it exists. The larger the district, you have to use that, right? You can't take it to the community and have genuine community engagement, involvement, or even empowerment, much less empowerment, if you don't take the 120 days that I was offered when I first got on board. You just have to go deep into the neighborhoods. So community engagement becomes very difficult the larger the system is. Yeah. So the Board of Education represent the needs, wants, and desires of those that we serve. And those are the values of the board. So going against the values of the board is a major, major, major issue, obviously. 
if I can give a little bit of a, a tip to superintendents uh, or aspiring superintendents or even student superintendents, I'm never concerned on whether I'm going to be here in this post tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, things can happen, mistakes can happen. Um, so putting that aside, you should see, you should have a long runway to see if your values mm -hmm. are going to be in conflict with potentially the board's values. And that happens in our case every two years, yeah. board elections. Those values shift. So That's I'll give you an shift. example. So if we have a shift here, and uh, we actually we have elections this upcoming November, mm -hmm. and we have three seats open. So if one is enough, but let's say three shift, and it's, uh, let's say, a certain movement that like to, let's say it's privatization, or let's say it's anti-equity, or, mm -hmm. or what's happening down in Florida. Right. I'm not going to sit here. Yeah. Telltale sign, okay my values and what I can do best do not align with potentially where this city is shifting, it's time for me to go. Yeah. Right? So you should never be in a situation in, in hoping, it doesn't work that way right. for us. So the martyr complex that can set in, oh, I gotta stick this out and help these, that. No. there's somebody out there who may share the values with the people running the place and who also loves kids and, Correct. right? Um, that's So back to the values, if I can, me knowing that there was an SRO resolution aligned. Hence why I applied and I said yes, uh, and all the other resolutions. Yeah. But again, crisis calls for leadership. Mm -hmm. And I also know that there has been a shift and some will argue that if we would have taken more stock, that it would have been more of a 50-50 balance in terms of whether sure. they wanted them or not. Yeah, sure. I think the debate yeah. now is more about what will we do beyond this school year. Yeah. And. Uh, Credit to my Board of Education, uh, the day after the incident, we really started to bring all of our ideas to fruition and they tasked me with an operational safety plan, which I've been working with um, experts from across the nation and even international, uh, local uh, perspective as well, making sure I go right back to how I engage those marginalized communities to see how they feel. I am the executive director of a nonprofit called Season with Grace Unboxed. We serve as the project coordinator for the Denver Task Force to reimagine policing and public safety. We came about, as many of the other ones did, uh, as a result of the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent Black Lives Matter protest that followed. And so um, brought together the community uh, for the purpose of figuring out how do we return the responsibility for public safety back to the community? What has happened in the last 50 years is that everything related to public safety has been placed on the desk of law enforcement. So if you have children that are out late at night, police fix it. You have people who are homeless, police fix it. If you have you know, a rise in youth violence, law enforcement, we need you to fix that. And so what we're saying is rather than, uh, we're saying the community is asking the right questions, but they're asking the wrong person. Uh, but one of the areas that we recognized uh, in 2020, 2021, that was uh, lagging was youth violence in general and youth violence in school in particular. And so we thought that uh, we could help to uh, explore uh, non-law enforcement options that we see are effective and the approach, which is to bring communities together, that that would be the best approach for the uh, challenges that are experiencing in school and that our young people experience in area. The uh, Superintendent Marrero has been tasked with developing a safety plan for the schools in the mm -hmm. wake of the shooting at East High. Um, and so um, I've been asked to be a part of his uh, advisory team Great. Help them to look at the safety plan and to figure out, uh, you know, what is the best approach moving forward. And is there a role for for school resource officers in that approach? I don't believe so. We have to seriously consider the cost benefit analysis. Do okay. the benefits of having SROs in our school outweigh the consequences, the cost? And we are very aware, I mean, every study, and you're aware of them, every study that has been done where SROs are in schools that have a population of uh, Black 
and, and then by default, uh, minor, other minorities, but primarily Blacks, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we see that, that, that uh, we, we, we accelerate the school to prison pipeline. And for anyone who's wondering, what is the school to prison pipeline? It is when you begin to treat children in school as if they are criminals and you begin to criminalize what, what in the 70s and 80s was just uh, juvenile uh, behavior. And you begin to treat it as a crime, ticketing and arresting kids for fights, talking back to teachers, uh, uh, skipping class and wandering around the hallways and things of that nature which means then that you introduce children to the criminal prosecution system, which means then that you accelerate the likelihood that they will be incarcerated as adults. Yeah. Accelerating that process, is that worth having someone there who may on that one in a million chance stop someone who is going to uh, come in and shoot at the school? An SRO cannot stop a school shooting. And the reason that they can't is because they're not clairvoyant. They're not psychic. They can't see yeah. into the future. So if you put an SRO at the front door, the shooter comes to the back door. Nearly every single school shooting that has taken place since Columbine, Columbine has had an SRO or a police officer in the school, and they have been completely incapable of preventing yeah. it. And in some cases, we saw law enforcement actually hiding Unless we're just going to basically assign a police officer to every youth in the city, uh, you're going to have yeah. a difficult time preventing youth violence using a law enforcement lens. I am concerned that myself and others, you know, the youth and the things that I spoke about, have been put there to provide cover, to be able to say we included the community, and that decisions have already been made. It's to me, it's pretty obvious. Decisions have already been made on what's going to happen. The safety plan has already been developed. It's a political expediency to say that you had uh, mm. you had community at the table and you had young people at the table. I think that the table lacks community representation, that it's it's heavy with individuals who uh, who think alike. I think that you're, you're, you're seeing a lot of group mm. think that's there because they're all educators for the most part yeah. of a handful of, of, of community members. Is it possible to train an electrical engineer how to do open heart surgery? Is that possible? Yeah, of course it is. Sure. Electrical engineers are very brilliant people. And yes, they could be trained. Is it practical? No, it's not. What's practical is to take people who specialize mm -hmm. in, 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 in cardiology and cardi you know, cardi uh, cardiology surgery and have them perform it, become the heart surgeons. And so asking law enforcement to do these things, while it is possible, is impractical. There are people in the community that actually have these various expertise, whether it is around school nutrition, whether it is around uh, mental health, youth mental health, whether it's about tra around trauma, uh, whether it's around anti-violence, whatever is the issue, we actually have people who don't carry a gun for a living who actually have expertise in that. And it would be wiser and more practical to empower them. The majority of Americans are not negatively impacted by law enforcement. Right. And so um, that's why they, they and, and law enforcement provides them with, with, with what white Americans have always wanted since the abolishing of slavery. And that is to be away from black people. Let's just call it what it is. And I know we talk about brown, but we have to start with, with the core, which was black and whites. That's what the country was. It was blacks and whites. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so law enforcement's job has been since its inception to either A, in the South, capture blacks in the North, uh, where you had freedmen to make sure that blacks stayed in their place. And that is something that has always worked, whether it was to ensure the Blacks stayed in their place during redlining, whether it's now to make sure Blacks stay in their place as it relates to ghettos and, 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 and low-income communities. That's what we want. And so uh, when you ask the Caucasian populace, 
what do you want? Or those who identify as Caucasian, what do you want? Their first thing is we need law enforcement. And if you ask, well, why do you need law enforcement? To keep us safe. To keep you safe from what? You live in uh, you know, gated communities. You live in affluency. There's not crime. You know, no, at least your children are not being targeted as criminals, even though we know that drug use and other activities are just as prevalent in middle class neighborhoods as they are in the ghetto. The sure. difference is they're just not policed. But why do you need it? We need it because the reality is in the back of our minds, in our hearts, we want to ensure that blacks are don't wander across. We, we have a, we, there's a, there is this invisible threshold that has always existed with how many blacks whites will tolerate in their space. And once that threshold is met, they need someone to ensure that the blacks are removed from their space. That is that that has that has always existed, especially since the uh, the end of slavery. I don't have all the answers. I, I really want to put that on the record. I don't have all the answers. Right. But what I do know is that we cannot go, we, not, we cannot continue to rely on people who are trained in one specific area to answer questions and to solve problems that are completely out of the scope of their expertise. We have to go to the people who have the skill and that's community. That's why communities have banks, hospitals, fire stations, gyms, grocery stores, et cetera. Just another layer of stuff going on there. Looking at it from the superintendent perspective and a sort of leadership challenge is that Dr. Marrero has kept Dr. Davis in the conversation. So, you know, they've, the, the board before Dr. Marrero enacted a policy to remove SROs from the campuses. Dr. Marrero acted single-handedly to bring officers back after the shooting. And now the board has re-adopted SROs in their schools. Um, and Dr. Davis still has a voice in the conversation, still has a seat at the table, and I think is a respected voice um, in that community. So that, to me, is part of part of the leadership theme we've been talking about in all these different episodes, is you know, making sure people feel heard and making sure that people can have a dialogue. That's sort of the, the, the best thing a superintendent can do in a difficult, tense, fraught political situation is make sure that everyone gets heard and then, you know, let the board make the policy decision it's going to make. So did they have to vote or he just said we're bringing them back in? Like he kind of overruled that because of the shooting? Well, he talks about that. So in the emergency moment right afterwards, he just told the police chief, get the officers back. And then, you know, he had to go reconcile with his board because he was essentially violating their policy. Yeah. And they eventually ended up um, deciding that that was the best path given the, the nature of things, as you heard from both Dr. Marrero and the then board president, Dr. Olson. The, the product, which will not only guide us in terms of the, the physical safety of the building, but also what are we going to do to honor, again, the adult experience and yeah. making sure that everybody feels safe and secure. So from the mental yeah. health, the social, emotional. So as a result, it really refocused us um, in terms of, hey, something worse could happen. Mm -hmm. Now, two of our educators were wounded no, thank the Lord that they're doing well and they yeah. they will be okay. Right. But we lost the student. Yeah. The student who who went away ended up taking his own life, and it's because of the coverage, right? And and ultimately, what he, I'm not going to say I, I know why. I wish I had the opportunity to engage. I've spoken to the parents, and and we have one less student as a result. So it doesn't get. Uh, tougher than that, Doug. And if not only if you can survive that, and pardon the term, but if, if the if the system can move on and grow from that, like we're in, we're invincible moving forward. Give me COVID, give me a reorg, give yeah, me new leadership, right, right. give me a strike, give me a shooting in a school, and not only will we persevere, we're going to keep getting stronger. So what else can happen? What else can happen? So that's the encouraging part. And you know, Doug, it's, it's interesting because two years ago at one of our summits, Dr. Marrero won the Dwight Jones Courageous Leader Award from IEI. And although I was there and I heard Dwight present it to him, I didn't really know what he did that was so courageous. It was during COVID and I thought he just really, you know, handled some challenging things. But this is bringing to light a whole new perspective I have about just how courageous of a leader he is. 
Yeah, and how, how courageous all of these district leaders are and, and how, you know, what the kind of um, makeup it takes to, to sit before the public and justify a decision. Now, you know, boards make policy decisions, right? But superintendents are the experts who provide the guidance and advice. And, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, the, 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 the proof is in the pudding when you can stand up before the public and explain why you're giving the guidance you're giving as the educational expert at the dais. And um, Dr. Marrero has, has no shortage of, uh, of expertise and no shortage of confidence that what he's doing is the best thing for the students that he serves. Well, this is a, a heartbreaking and horrific thing that happens, unfortunately, around the country that we now have to talk about more frequently than I would like to say, but... Yeah. Um, I'm excited for next episode, maybe a little more uplifting. So join us for our next episode of Stories from the Field, the Superintendent Podcast.